Okay, so this is the, the last lecture. I'd like to discuss random loop representations for quantum Heisenberg model. So, uh, what we have seen in the first three hours were basic fundamental stuff. Now it's going to be a little bit more um, peculiar, I'd, I, I would say. Uh, it's definitely closer to, to my research and also to uh, to, 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 to rest on, I mean, the recent research area. So I, I find this uh, random loop representations to be a fascinating topic, and uh, I hope you, you'll get a sense uh, of this too. The, those ideas go back to, to Feynman in 1953, so okay, 60 years ago, uh, who introduced uh, uh, what came to be known as the Feynman Katz representation for, for the interacting Bose gas. It was introduced actually directly in the, the context of interacting Bose gas. Uh, the representations I'm going to discuss here, they are more recent, always in years in three. So, so they are motivated by Conlon Solovey, who used a random walk approach to the Heisenberg ferromagnet to get some uh, interesting low bound for the free energy. Uh, this was in 91. But then uh, this prompted Balin to get uh, to, to improve the bounds. And he used, uh, and this was in 93, exactly 20 years ago. And he, he used the random loop method, I mean, random loop representation, which is going to be a special case of what we, we are going to, to see uh, today. And uh, Almost at the same time, there is a beautiful work by Eisenman and Nachtergale. Uh, in 94. So the thing is that those two papers were for the ferromagnet, for the Heisenberg ferromagnet, and this is for, for the Heisenberg anti-ferromagnet. And Eisenman Nachtergale's representation is similar, yet introduces different objects. And, uh, well, my, my talk is going to be based on my recent work in, well, uh, 13. It's, it just appeared in a JMP, which can be viewed as a synthesis of those two representations. And we can actually mix them and get uh, extra models like the XY model, and also new interesting uh, correlation functions, which, are, which do give some extra information on the phases. So I'd like to, to first start with uh, defining the model of random loop. Once we understand what it is, I'll state the precise equivalence between quantum systems and those uh, random loop models. So model of random loop. And uh, well, it works for an arbitrary finite graph. So as before, we have uh, the, the, the graph lambda with a set of edges. We have two parameters. One is, the, is beta. Uh, by the way, does it work? Yes. One is the parameter beta positive, which represents the inverse temperature, as we will see it. But here, it's just a, a parameter. And the other parameter is this parameter u, which has to be between 0 and 1. And with those two parameters, we have the following. So let me draw a graph here. And I'm going to, to draw a linear graph, simply because it's much easier to, to depict. But I insist it works on all graphs. Um, so here you have a graph. And then to each edge, we add an interval 0 to beta. So we go up to beta. 0 to beta. And then on those edges, we can have occurrences of events. And the, the events are the, the following. Uh, or actually, let me state it. So at each edge of E, the set of edges, we have a Poisson point process. A process on interval on interval from zero to beta. So I hope you you have an idea of what the Poisson point process is. 
it's really the simplest situation where you have an interval of time and then you say that at any time something may happen which means that uh, <coughs> sorry you, if you take a small amount of time over here the probability that something happens as probability dt of the intensity times dt and with probability one you have only one event at a, at a given microscopic time also, what happens over here is totally independent from what happens at every d other interval. So this is a Poisson point process. Uh, in all what I'm going to say, there will be integrals of a Poisson point process and things like that. Uh, think uh, like uh, like Marcus apparently uses to say, according to, to Eisenman, be wise, discretize. So the best way to understand Poisson point process is to imagine that you have uh, discrete. Uh, time intervals and uh, maybe the time interval is like 1 over n and then the probability that you get an event over here is the intensity times 1 over n and only one event at a given time is allowed everything is independent for each uh, interval and everything converges nicely in the limit and tends to infinity so so we have uh, we consider this interval of time 0 to beta and we have uh, two possible events we have the crosses which I'm going to depict like that with intensity u this parameter u over here and we have the double bars with intensity 1 minus u so what it means over here is that for every time interval there is probability u dt that the cross appears and 1 minus u dt that the bar appears and we can look at the random uh, at the random occurrence i'm going to be very careful about to which random events i'm choosing because for some reason my random events always lead to one single loop and that's not what i want to do so i'm going to take the random event over here a carefully selected one and suppose you have a cross over here double bars over here there can be many events we can have a cross over here we can have a double bar over here and let's put a cross over here so that could be one given realization of this uh, Poisson point processes on every it interval for each edge everything is independent from uh, one edge to, to the other and the idea is that given those uh, I mean a realization of this process we can introduce loops. How do we do loops? Well, it's kind of simple. We, we start anywhere, let's say here, move up, say, and then the, the prescription is that whenever you meet a cross, you cross and continue in the same direction. It's exactly like the picture suggests. So the, the loop continues over here. Now comes the double bar, you cross, and then you go down, you change direction. So now we meet this, uh, this cross, we are here. Then something very important is that we have periodic boundary conditions uh, uh, in this direction. So we go down, we continue down over here. Here we meet the double bar again, we cross and we change direction. And we continue. We cross, same direction because it's a cross. We continue over here, double bars, we go down. Eventually we are going to, to close the loop. So we are here, we cross, and yes, here we have finally crossed the loop. So this is one loop in this realization. And we still have some uh, uh, leftovers, so we can continue and introduce, uh, I mean, look at a different loop. So let's start over here. We move up, cross, up, double bars, down, double bar, up, and then here, and we close it. So now we have exhausted all the, the possible vertical lengths. So this is a given realization with exactly two loops. So we have those uh, independent uh, um, occurrences of edge of crosses and double bars, and um, and here we have two loops. Let me maybe write it down here. Two loops which uh, in the notation I'm going to use, it means that L omega equals 2. Notation is as follows. Omega is going to 
to denote the realization of his Poisson point process. So the location, I mean the number of locations of all the crosses and bars. And L omega is the set of loops uh, of omega. Cardinality means how many loops you, you have. So in this uh, instance, we have exactly two. So given this uh, process, we can introduce a partition function. And it's going to be Well, the partition function, as usual, is going to be the integral over all possible uh, realization of our statistical, me uh, statistical mechanics model. So we integrate over d rho omega. D rho it denotes the, this Poisson point process at every interval. And then we wait by, the, by something very important. It's going to be 2 times the number of loops. So this is the, the, the model we, we consider. And the relevant probability measure of this system, well, it's exactly what you have over here. In order to have a probability measure, we have to divide by the right normalization. So let's write this as d mu of omega. It's going to be 1 over the partition function and 2 to the number of loops of our realization and this zero of omega. So again, if you worry about uh, those, those crosses and bars, think of discretizing the, the time interval and then everything is completely explicit. And also integrals really means sum over this uh, is essentially boundary random variables at every point. And uh, some trivial observation is that with probability one, we have a finite number of uh, bars and, and, uh, and crosses, no accumulation points and things like that. So those loops are very well defined. So the, we need random variables. As you know, random variables are measurable functions from the from the, the set of possible realization to, to real numbers. And the, the relevant quantities we consider, random variables, uh, are the following. So one is uh, the indicator for uh, that x and y belong to the same uh, same loop. So the picture is as follows. So let me try. Here I'm going to put the, the, the graph in the middle, since we have periodic boundary conditions. And let's uh, draw the, the, the time interval like that. It goes from minus beta over 2 to beta over 2. It's, not, uh, it, it's periodic, so it doesn't matter. So we choose at time 0, I mean, we have x and y. Now, given the realization, what may happen is that the x and y belong to the same loop or not. So 1 is 1 if they belong to the same loop, 0 it, if it's not. So this gives the, the probability, I mean, when we take the expectation of this, we get the probability that x and y are connected by a, by a loop. Then we have uh, interesting, uh, let, let me actually also show the, what do we get? I hope we are connected here, so we would go up, up and down. Yes, we are. So in this instance, x and y are, are, co are connected. Uh, actually, yes, it had to be connected. Then we are going to, to introduce two events, which is how we are connected. Yes? Uh, yes, uh, x and y are vertices in the graph. And in this picture, they are always at time 0, if this is the time direction. Yes? Then there are basically two ways of being connected. You can be connected like this picture. If you move up, then you go down. And then you continue down over here, and you get up. Which means that, um, I mean, you can give a, a direction to the loop. And the direction of this travels, let's say, in the up direction. Here, it's in the opposite down direction. And if you choose a different convention, like it's down here, that would be up over here. So you can be connected like that, or you can be connected um, 
differently. So for instance, what happens if you have only crosses? Is that you're always connected in the same direction. So you move up over here, and actually the loop is always going to move up. You move up, up, periodic boundary conditions, and you reach, uh, you reach Y. So, so here one is connected in a different way from here. And I'm going to distinguish the, those two events. So I'm going to, to write things in a picturally obvious way. So this means X going to Y exactly like this picture over here. So again, this is an indicator function. If you are connected by moving in the same direction in at X and Y, then this is 1, otherwise this function is 0. And uh, the other possible connections I'm going to write as X going to Y like that. Again, it's a function of realization. It can be 0, 1. And the last random variable of relevance is going to be the length of loops. So let's denote Lx omega, the length of a loop that contains x. Or more precisely, x at time 0. Well, how is defined the length of a loop? That's by definition the length of the vertical components of a loop. We take this as a definition. And so, for instance, we immediately observe that uh, 0 is less, or actually strictly less than Lx of omega with probability 1. And this is less or equals than beta lambda. In the case that you have one single loop, then indeed you have a vertical intervals of length beta at every site, and this is what, uh, what you would get. It's actually good to know that the maximum length we can get is something which is like Macroscopic, it's proportional to the volume. So let me now give you the, the relations between this uh, probabilistic model and the quantum Heisenberg model. So relations between quantum Heisenberg and random loops. And to, to make things a bit simple, I'm going to, to stick to S equals 1 half. It's only for S equals 1 half when we have connection between the, the usual Heisenberg model. But we do have interesting connections for, for models with higher spins. So I'm going to change the notation slightly. And the, the Hamiltonian I'm going to consider is H lambda of u. No magnetic field this time. And it's going to be equal to minus 2 the sum over edges, as before, Sx1, Sy1. It's just that the, the asymmetric parameter, I'm going to, to write it as 2u minus 1. Sx2, Sy2, plus Sx3, Sy3. And it does not hurt to add a constant to, to this Hamiltonian, minus 1 fourth. It, of course, plays no, no role. And u is going to be between 0 and 1. So this parameter is between minus 1 and 1. So it's exactly the, the situation we are considering. It so happens that um, writing this way, this, this way, we get this parameter u in the random loop model. And so the theorem is as follows. So this, maybe I can put. So I should move up the last one, probably. So the, the theorem for one, which was proved prog progressively in uh, Balintot's paper, Eisenman Nachtragala, in my, and in my recent paper, is that we assume the parameter u to be between 0 and 1. So it has to be, bit, I mean, the asymmetric parameter between minus 1 and 1. And then we have that. Um, we have the following ex equivalence. First, the partition function of a quantum model is equivalent to the one of, our, of a random loop model. So partition function. We have that uh, if you take integral 2 to the number of loops, 
zero of omega, then this gives you exactly the trace of exponential minus beta h lambda of u with uh, the model with a minus one fourth. So that's the reason why the notation is like that. I'll give you a little bit of explanations why it's so. Then we have uh, uh, expressions for the correlation function. And this is really what is remarkable in, in those loop models. I mean, as observed by Balintot and, uh, and Eisenman Nartergale, which is that the quantum correlations are given exactly by the, uh, the, the usual loop correlations. So precisely, if you to consider the correlation functions in the spin directions 1 and 3, we have at um, the two-point function Sx and Y in the direction Y. Well, it's, uh, we have symmetry between the, the 1 and 3 directions, so we can also say that it's like Sx3, Sy3, that's evident. And this is given by 1 fourth and the probability that one is connected to, sorry, that x is connected to y. So this is about the two-point function. And uh, then we can also write down something for the correlation function in direction two. And uh, what one should expect is that in the direction two, we have a little bit less coupling. So it's quite natural to, to expect that there, there is uh, less correlations. And indeed, this is made explicit by the expression here, namely that uh, Sx2, Sy2 is given by one fourth. And then we get the difference between those two ways of being correlated, either by going up. So probability that uh, x goes to y like that, minus the probability that x goes to y like that. So, so maybe it's some comments. So for instance, if you set u equals 1, this corresponds to Heisenberg ferromagnet. It's also rotation invariant. So for obvious rotation variants, all those correlations should be the same. Now in this case, you have only crosses. And the, the only possible way of of uh, correlating things is by moving only up. I mean, this is always zero. So then you get indeed equivalence. Then you can make uh, the same arguments for the anti-ferromagnet, u equals zero. When you are on a bipartite lattice, then uh, if you're on the, on, on the A sub lattice, say you move up, then you cross, you move down. And then you cross, you move up again. So on the A sub lattice, you always move up. On the B sub lattice, you always move down. And then, depending on whether x and y are in the same sublattice or not, you get the full probability over here, over here, and you get this alternating property. So this is also to be expected. Um, for the end Heisenberg antiferromagnet, well, this is not quite the Heisenberg antiferromagnet. There is this unitary equ equivalence. Uh, this is antiferromagnetic order, which is equivalent to ferromagnetic order in the other directions. That's one sees also. But then for, for other models, we get that we have these uh, two, two ways of connecting. So let me show you the uh, ideas of proof. And they are nice, actually. So there is something which makes the, those models very peculiar, which is that the interaction uh, the interaction operators can be written in terms of two very simple operators as far as uh, stochastic representations are concerned. So let's uh, describe those operators. So the operators, we have uh, this one. So Txy, it acts on the spin space with uh, just two, two sides. If you act on a basis element where you have spin A at x and spin B at, at y, it just transposes the two terms, so it gives B A. So the T is the transposition operator. And then uh, let's consider another operator in such a way that its matrix elements are as follows. Uh, this is either 0 or 1, and it's 1 provided those two spins are equal and those two spins are equal. The, the rest doesn't matter. So delta AB, 
delta CD. So let's consider those two operators and uh, a little bit of algebra shows the following. So one can check that if you take this uh, SXSY, then this can be expressed in terms of a transposition operator for spin one half, I insist. This is one half TXY and then comes the minus one fourth. And also, the operator Q also has a very simple description in terms of usual spin operators. If you take SX1, SY1, minus SX2, SY2, plus SX3, SY3, then you get the one half Q, also with a minus one fourth. So this uh, can, be, can be checked. And then uh, we can rewrite the, the Hamiltonian as follows. So this h lambda u becomes just a linear combination of, uh, of the t's and the q's. So it's minus the sum over edges of u t x y plus 1 minus u q x y minus 1. There is this minus 1, which turns out to be useful for, for the representation too. So this is not hard to, to check. I mean, from uh, here to, to here, it's not surprising. You take u and minus u and one minus u over here, you get the you get the one coefficient one be between sx one sy one. Also here and here, you get the linear combination of u and minus one minus u. So you get the two u minus one. That's obvious. <laughs> Uh, sorry, that's this one. So, to prove it, I'm going to, to give you a, a lemma, which is something like a, a Poisson expansion for, for operators. And it can be formulated like that. So, let A1 AK, we have finitely many uh, bounded operators and the row a Poisson point process on the, the following set. So it's 1 up to K, Cartesian product with interval 0, 1 with intensity 1. So what does it mean? It means that we have uh, the points 1, 2, 3, and we go up to k. And for each of these points, we have interval from 0 to 1. So, so, so here, it's really the, the process is on the, on the points. And uh, then, The, the claim is as follows. If you take uh, this operator exponential and you sum j equals 1 to k aj minus 1, so we have the exponential of this sum of operators, this can be written as the integral 0 omega of uh, the ordered product over all jt in the realization omega and aj. So omega gives us some points for each of these, um, uh, of these intervals. And then uh, every time we have a point on the, the interval for 1, we'll put the operator 1 and so on. And we take the, this product according to the order that we get. So for instance, if we have a realization with maybe one point over here, two points over here, and let's say uh, four, one, two points, then to, to this realization corresponds the following product of operators. So the first one would be A2, then A4, then A2 again, A1, and A4. So, we, so, so on the right side, we integrate over all possible possibilities of this. And then for a given realization, we look at the given product of operators. So you. You, you can, again, discuss it this time, sum explicitly about the number of occurrences, where they occur, and all this gives you the, the left side. 
So this, I'm not sure exactly the history of this. I learned it from the paper of uh, Eisenman Nachtregale. So it goes uh, back at least to them, possibly uh, still uh, back. And um, then, so I'm not going to, to prove this. It's not hard. I mean, really discretize this time, this process, um, and use for, for instance, throttle product formula or things like that. You look at all possible combinations uh, of this. Also, th there is an obvious uh, generalization. Suppose you, you put some uh, real parameters a, j over here. Then you get exactly the same uh, expansion. The only difference is that uh, those AJs are going to, to be used as intensities in the Poisson point process over here. So each vertex will have intensity AJ. So, so indeed, when we have something like U times the operators, we'll get another point process with intensity U. So, so then to, to prove, uh, I mean, I'm going to give you a very short proof of uh, theorem 4.1. A. I mean, it's not even a sketch proof. So if you take the trace of exponential minus beta h lambda of u, so here you will have uh, lots of operators. You have the operators with intensity u and ones with intensity 1 minus u. And for every edge, you have something. So you're going to, to label, I mean, in this, uh, this thing over here, the edges are going to, to be the, the host of Poisson point processes. And you can also think that you have two point processes, one with intensity u, one with intensity 1 minus u. And this, the trace, is like the sum over uh, basis. And you can take the basis where you have uh, spin configurations. So at every site, you have either minus 1 half or plus 1 half times lambda. And then you have the inner product sigma. And this operator over here, you, you expand this way. I'm just going to, to give you a picture over here. So, so we have a graph. The interval from 0 to beta. And then we have a realization, like uh, I guess the realization I have here is not too bad. For instance, like that, and you have still a sigma over here. And the, the understanding of this is that this realization, I mean, this configuration, you should put it over here. So you have a one half at every point. And then uh, uh, this corresponds to a product of operators. You can sum over all possible, uh, possible values you get uh, over there. There will be restrictions, because then you have the inner product of uh, those, those uh, those vectors with, the, with the operators over here. But they, you always get 0, 1. You get 1 provided uh, you get the, the right prescription, which is that for crosses, you have a transposition. So the, the value of the spin here and here must be the same, and here and here must be the same. If yes, you get 1. If not, you get 0. And the same for the double bars. You have this restriction that here and here it must be the same, here and here it must be the same. So when you, you think carefully about it, the sum of all compatible spin configurations, uh, you can uh, better understand it by looking at the loop picture. And the spin value must be constant at each loop. And then you have uh, two possibilities for each loop. So you get uh, this integral d rho of omega, 2 to the number of loops. So, so of course, I'm going very fast, and I'm quite shaky with all these things. But again, by is discretized, and for the discretized model, it's very long expansions because you have plenty of Bernoulli random variables, but it's nothing difficult. So this is the, the way these things can be understood. And if you have correlation functions, that would be the same. But in addition, you would extract the value of a spin. And you can check that you have two possibilities. Um, uh, yes, I have still 20 minutes, yeah. So you have two possibilities. Either things are in different loops. And then if um, two points are in uh, different loops, when you sum over possible spin values and you have a sigma x, sigma y, by a symmetry, you are canceling things and you get 0. 
On the other hand, if things belong to the same loop, then they are locked to be the, to the same value, and you have the sigma square, so you get the one fourth. And that's exactly what you, you get there. It's slightly more subtle when you have uh, SX2, SX, uh, I mean, the operator to S2. And then it depends whether, if you go from a one half, I mean, this would uh, change, uh, change the value of the spin. If, and in one direction, you get a sign, in the other, you don't, and that's uh, where you get the, the difference. So, so this is uh, the, the way to, to understand those, those pictures. Let, now, let me give you further relations. And to, to, to get a better understanding of what are the important properties of the random loop models, which you can relate to actual physical quantities for the quantum spin system. And uh, so one can formulate it like theorem 4.3. Let me give you two relations, and we'll understand things uh, in a slightly simpler context afterwards. So the expectation in the random loop picture, now we take the sum over all x in lambda, Lx. And this can be re given in terms of a quantum model, like 4 over beta, d square over dh square of the log, the trace, exponential minus beta h lambda of u, and we add the beta h to, uh, yeah, I guess I have a beta, sum over, S, sum over x, sx3, at h equals 0. So, so something which is quite natural over here is related to something which is also very natural in the quantum spin system, that's the susceptibility, magnetic susceptibility. Then, Another property is to, to understand the relations between properties of loops and the other parameters for, for spontaneous magnetization. And we can formulate the following inequality. So for beta, the sum over xy, s3, x, sy3. And let me change colors because the next term is not important, but it's uh, complicated, minus k beta. If you cannot read it, it's even better. One minus u, number of edges, take the square root of this. Square root of expectation of the sum of Lx. And this is less or equal than the expectation of the sum of Lx over x. And this is less or equal than exactly what we have over here, the four beta sum over x and y. I know it's too, too small, but uh, that's exactly, I'm uh, just rewriting what is over in the left side in, in white. Sx3, Sy3. So this is the, the claim, and let me explain it. I'm just going to, to rewrite the, those two properties. In the special case where we have a box with periodic boundary conditions and translation invariance, and we understand better. This statement turns out to work for any finite graph. So, in case of a regular lattice, I mean a regular cubic lattice of size L, and we can do the following. So A gives you the expectation of the length of the, the loop, which contains the origin. And I mean, I'm just using the fact that all sites are equivalent, so, so this is just up to a, a volume term the same as this. The expectation is linear, as everybody remembers. So this is like 4 over beta, d square over dh square. And then you'll get the free energy at beta h at h equals 0. So this is the first thing. This is the su magnetic susceptibility. And the F lambda is the free energy after division by the volume. This is the, the function which is supposed to converge to, to the nice thermodynamic potential. And there are two possibilities. Uh, when you look at the left side, either 
uh, in the infinite volume limit, this expectation of the size of a loop stays finite. And then there should be no problem with the second derivative here. Or you may have diverging size of loops. And then something happens because the magnetic susceptibility, susceptibility does not converge to something. The second derivative will be infinite for, for this uh, function. So we already see that if uh, one can prove, for instance, that the size of loops diverge, something happens, some phase transition happens. The second claim is that uh, uh, we can relate it to the magnetization, so 4 beta. And then let's take the expectation of the magnetization operator divided by the volume to the square. You remember that m lambda is the sum of, uh, of Sx3 to the square, so you get the sum x, y, and so on. And then uh, we have a correction. So, so minus, now comes k beta divided by lambda, this 1 minus u d, and e. Uh, that's right, the number of uh, edges is d times the volume. And expectation of L0 over lambda, also in square root. This is less or equal than the expectation of L0 over lambda, which is less or equal than, uh, again, the right side, so 4 beta. Uh, and the, the quantum expectation of a magnetization operator to the square. So, so the key observation here is that uh, if in the case where this is uh, bounded away from zero, it says that uh, the expectation over here is bounded away from zero. So L0, the length of a, of a given loop divided by volume, converges to some non-trivial random variable, which has certainly not go converging to the zero. And this shows the, the occurrence of macroscopic loops. You have loops of size like the volume of a system. So this is the key thing. So this implies that um, spontaneous magnetization, what we discussed uh, in the last few hours, uh, this is equivalent to macroscopic loops. And this correction is, uh, is not very important, because this is uh, something bounded. Uh, L0 over lambda is at most beta. So this is something bounded. You still divide by the volume. So, so you can neglect this. And by the way, how to, to prove this? Uh, it's not hard. The, this inequality, or I mean, I should say this inequality over here, well, it turns out that this is directly related. Uh, well, you, you have it here. And this second derivative is the Duhamel two-point function. So here we have a Duhamel two-point function, here the usual uh, correlation function. And you remember that we derived one inequality in a simple way. So this is this one over here. And the other inequality, it's a lower bound. It's, it comes from a Falkbruch. And you have square root, so not surprising. So this is, uh, this is the, this equivalence. I still have uh, 10 minutes, actually, even f almost 15. So I'd like to, to discuss two things briefly. It's going to be very qualitative. So what one can do with those random loop representations, uh, I mentioned a little bit what Balintot did. I'm not going to mention much about uh, what Eisenman and Artergale did. They also had a very good purpose for introducing the representations to understand the certain properties of anti-ferromagnetic spin chains. And what... Uh, I mean, one connection with those, all those random loops at the reflection positivity and infrared bounds we saw before is that one can apply the method uh, over here. And for the spin one half system, it turns out that one gets exactly the same results as Dyson Lip Simon, Kennedy Lip Shastri. But when applying it to the spin one system, one gets a result which is, uh, which is actually new. So, this I'm going to, to describe in five minutes. But first, I'd like to, to discuss something else which is the, the hardcore Bose gas. So I think it's a nice topic. And the one motivation to discuss it here is that uh, there was, uh, of course, I mean, there was this program uh, in, at IHP in, uh, in Paris. 
and uh, with Robert Zeinger and Alessandro Giuliani, where there were some discussions about the super solid phase in the, in the XY model. And maybe it's, uh, it's good to, to see it in the context of uh, those random loop representations too. So the question of the hardcore balls gas. I treat it in more details in, in the notes. I mean, it's also something quite standard. I'm not even sure where, how back it goes. And uh, the idea is to look at um, a model where you also have a lattice. And you have uh, bosons over there. Uh, and the Hamiltonian is going to be the, the Laplacian, the discrete Laplacian for, for bosons. They have interactions, and interactions is on site and it's infinitely repulsive. And so the Hamiltonian can be, can be written the following way H lambda equals minus, and people would write it in second quantization. So let me just give it to you. Where we introduce those creation and annihilation operators. And okay, let's forget the, um, some possible constants. And these are creation and annihilation operators. They satisfy anti commutation relations at, uh, on site because of this infinite repulsion. So, so then uh, it's easy to make a, a correspondence between those operators and the spin operators. And you also have this thing that at every site you have two possibilities. So, previously we had plus or minus uh, one half. And here we have either zero particles or one particle. And so, as it turns out, this is completely equivalent to the XY model. So, so then the, the question which is a current, uh, of current interest, I mean, very interesting and very hotly debated by physicists, is the existence of a super solid phase. And it means a phase where you have interacting bosons and you expect both off-diagonal long-range order, so the, the order parameter for boson and condensation, and the regular solid phase. So what about uh, translating all those questions in this simple model, which is the hardcore Bose gas? And so what do we get is that uh, the bose einstein condensation order parameter is equivalent to this off-diagonal long-range order, par order parameter, which can be written as uh, the expectation of I a star x a y. So this is another parameter introduced by Penrose and Zeiger in 1956. And the, the idea is that you look at this creation function in a large system. So you have a box lambda. You first take it to infinity. Then you can look at whether this goes to 0 or not when x and y goes to infinity. That's the question. And uh, this is equivalent to the Sx3, Sy3. So for instance, it immediately follows from reflection positivity, I mean the results of Dyson Lip Simon, or more precisely the ones of Kennedy Lip Shastri, that uh, this does not go to zero. So this does not go to zero. And this is actually, to, to this day, the only proof of uh, Bose Einstein condensation in the interacting system. There is also a recent paper of uh, Eisenman, Lieb, Saringer, Solovey, and I must be forgetting one, Ingvason. Uh, with some uh, extensions, we have also uh, a potential which is uh, not translation variant, but has the chessboard property. So, so, so the thing is that, uh, uh, I mean, this is one part of this question of super solid, the existence of bose einstein condensation, and this is related to, to long range order in the direction one or three, in the strong directions. Now, you have uh, the question of a solid. So, the solid phase, it's the, the usual long range order for the Bose gas, and it's co connected to, to the following correlation function. You get an X and y minus, and you have to subtract the mean because it's not zero, and x and y. So this is the so-called density-density correlation function. 
Uh, again, you, you want to take first the infinite volume limit, second the, the limit x and y goes to, to infinity. The question is whether something remains. And this uh, is equivalent to the Sx2, Sy2. So then you get the, the two-point correlation function in the spin directions, but in the weak direction. And the question is, can you have both uh, this to be non-zero and this to be non-zero? And this is actually quite a subtle, uh, subtle question. For higher spin interactions, you can prove that actually, uh, well, provided you also have a little bit of anisotropic uh, interactions, then you can have long-range order in the weak direction. And this, I, I discussed this in, in the notes. Uh, everything goes through. But it does not seem to work for, uh, for the spin one half. And indeed, uh, using the random loop representation, this is connected to this difference of probabilities of being connected uh, by below and connected by above. So now one can make a heuristic argument that if you have, uh, I mean, at any temperature for any, any graph, you can look at two points, and uh, then th there might be only a tiny probability that they be connected by a loop. So then you would have already some good decay properties for, for this correlation. Now suppose that you have, you are in the best situation where there is a genuine, I mean, a non-zero probability of connecting the, the two points. Then the question is whether you are likely to connect it from the top or, or from below. And then it's a bit like a one-dimensional system where you can change direction at any time, and you expect that this kind of correlation function decays exponentially. So this is a good um, way to see why this should decay exponentially. And the conjecture is that this has exponential decay for all beta, all values of u which are not 0 or 1, and all possible graphs. So this is uh, one thing. And the second thing I'd like to, to discuss, just to give you a little bit of idea of what can be done with those uh, random group representation. And this is going to be purely qualitative. I still have full page here, but I'm not going to use it. So this is to discuss the SU2 invariant. Actually, it should be bigger. SU2 invariant model with spin 1, spin s equals 1. And uh, so there is, of course, the, I mean, the Heisenberg model makes sense for every spin s. The random group representation also works for any spin, but it's not, I mean, the correspondence with Heisenberg was only because, I mean, for s equals 1 half. That's something I should really insist. So now, a general model for spin uh, s equals 1 has the following shape. H equals minus sum over nearest neighbors x, y, and v edges. And then we can have uh, one, I mean, we have the operator Sx times Sy, but also the operator Sx times Sy to the square. There was no such thing for S equals 1 half, because it's easy to check that this is a constant. Uh, but for the spin one k s equals one case, this is uh, not a constant anymore. So you should add it, and this is the general uh, family of, um, of SU2 invariant models. Then it has a very interesting phase diagram, which is yet to be fully understood. So if you put over here J1, here J2, you get the following: in the direction J1, J2 equals zero. This is the Heisenberg ferromagnetic model, while in this direction, J1 negative and J2 equals 0, this is the Heisenberg antiferromagnet. There is another model which I should just mention, that's the so-called AKLT model. This is in this direction with a slope 1, 6. AKLT is named after Affleck, Kennedy, Lip, Tasaki, and, uh, well, it has a very special properties which allows uh, those gentlemen to, to, to derive interesting properties. I'm not going to discuss it further, but it's uh, part of this uh, general setting. Then uh, there are two lines which are very important in this phase diagram. One is this direction over here, and one is the slope of, uh, 
of slope one, I mean the line of slope one. And the reasons of those two lines is that we have more symmetries. Everything is SU2 symmetric, but here you get SU3 symmetry, and here too. And uh, one should suspect that something happens along those lines, and indeed it is expected that they split the, the domains. In dimensions three and more, what is expected is that the whole domain over here, bordered by those uh, colored lines, is anti-ferromagnetic. So I should insist that uh, what we proved was the, the result for, for this line. It can be extended with minor difficulties in the neighborhood, uh, in the upper, upper quadrant. And there is anti-ferromagnetism there. It's expected to be over there. Then over here, one expects ferromagnet. And uh, over here, we get here an, a nematic phase. And here, stagger nematic. What is nematic? Well, nematic is this phase which, uh, which is present for liquid crystals, where you align things. But if you have arrows, you, it doesn't matter whether it points up or down. And for spins, classically, naively, you would expect that you have a situation where you choose, you select an angle, but then things can be pointing in the same direction, so in the anti-direction. And, uh, well, one can uh, introduce other parameters. And uh, so the only thing I'd like to, to say is that in, uh, in for this region, it turns out that the, um, uh, the loop representation works. So when you look at the spin S equals 1 system, you'll get exactly this equivalence uh, stated somewhere, except that the model with the loops is not 2 to the number of loops, but 3 to the number of loops. But then it works for, for the model which interpolates between those two values. One can also apply reflection positivity here, even though it's not obvious, but one could do it in the quantum system, in this part over here, so only in, a, in half of the part. And one can prove the, I mean, one can use the classical reflection positivity combined with a random loop picture to prove the, the existence of phase transition in, the, um, in this domain, which is compatible with a nematic long range order. So I just wanted to, to, to also to, to make the link with some very recent research about those uh, spin systems. Well, thank you.